You know, we are surrounded with so many messages from culture and they come at us from all directions. Messages that tell us that we're not enough, that we need to be more, especially when it comes to the area of beauty. Well, in this episode of the Living Room Podcast, we're going to peel back some of the messages of the world and downright lies that culture is telling us so that we can discover what God says true beauty is. Because the world's concept is not only misleading, it can be truly dangerous, not just to us physically, but spiritually as well. Well, Melissa Johnson, welcome to the Living Room. I'm so glad you're with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I am really excited about your new book, Soul Deep Beauty, Fighting for Our True Worth in a World Demanding Flawless. Oh my goodness, Mm. isn't that exactly it? Yes, yes. Yes. Can you talk to us about that? (laughs) Where do we start? We are in this age of... um, these beauty standards that I think they've been, I would say like oppressive and unhelpful, damaging for decades. I mean, maybe even generations, um, obviously I've only lived so long. Um, but I think that especially when we consider, uh, the like widespread impact of media and social media these days, I think things, this idea of this flawless beauty or, um, body image standard has really gotten ramped up. And I think, you know, specifically I'm thinking about like uh, Jean Kilborn's research. Um, who, she started taking a look at ads back in the 1960s and, um, you know, since then has talked a lot about how advertisements they impact us. And, you know, back in, um, for me growing up in the eighties and nineties, you know, we knew that images were photoshopped in, in magazines. Um, quite honestly though, I don't know if that really impacted how I looked at those images. I still consider those images to be real. Um, however, coming back to Jean Kilborn, she talks about how, you know, the images that we look at are rarely real. And I think that was true back in the eighties and nineties back with those magazines, but now it's not just celebrities. It is, our own image, um, our own filtered image. And then we also consider, you know, our friends, our peers. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a couple statistics regarding, uh, you know, filtered images on social media. So basically we know that um, two thirds, nearly two thirds of American adults edit their photos before posting them. We also know that 80% of girls have used an app to change their appearance before the age of 13. We also know that girls ages 10 to 17 were found to spend five hours on social media every day. And so we have this inundation of this unreal, literally fake uh, image of beauty that we are being bombarded with. Uh, Also, there's a documentary called The Illusionist that was made back in 2015, 2016, And at that point, that documentary, they estimated that by the year 2020, we would be at the point of media saturation where 80% of our waking hours, we'd be exposed to some kind of media. I spoke with Elena Rossini, who was the, she's the filmmaker and also uh, the producer for that film. And I spoke with her recently and she's working on her next film. And she thinks we're at the point of 80% or beyond at this point. Um, And so if we are literally being bombarded with fake images uh, that tell us, that elicit shame, essentially, it's this feeling that we are not enough, that there's something wrong with our bodies or with our, how we look, and we do need to change it. And so hearkening back to your question about the the subtitle of the book, uh, you know, this world demanding flawless, I, I do believe that because of this inundation of you know, like these quote, perfect images where there are no pores. Um, You know, we have, you know, perfectly flawless skin with no wrinkles. One, one last thing I will, I'll mention on this, because we could just keep going on this for, for a long time. Um, One trend that I recently found especially alarming is the increase in skincare products among like teenagers and, and young adult women. You know, the anti-aging industry used to be more like, you know, mid thirties and plus, but now we're seeing it among like preteens and teens, um, you know, on TikTok and with these where, where people are selling and, um, and kind of going into these detailed skin routines. And there's a lot of fear around aging and, you know, fine lines and wrinkles. And so the skincare industry has 
really ramped up um, in in recent years. And I'll just anecdotally, I have a friend who um, she has a, a preteen, and uh, she was saying that you know she her preteen's birthday female. Uh, her birthday was coming up and initially her her birthday list gift list was like had to do with like crafts and things like that but then she had some teenage friends come and visit and after that uh, visit all of her requests turned to different skincare products well it kind of makes me wonder if a mm. lot of this can be traced even clear back to the garden of eden you know, mm. when when all of a sudden mm. sin came into the world mm. and Adam and Eve felt the need to hide. And so mm. they sewed fig leaves. And I wonder sometimes, mm. you know, we've got all of the beauty culture, we've got all of the diet culture, but I think there's a chronic epidemic of not enoughness. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm not quite enough. And, and yeah. so... And, and, you know, and, and what is that? Can we lay that at the feet of the beauty industry or is that part of our fallen nature? I know in the book you talk about um, your own journey with with maybe feeling like I've, I've got I'm not enough. I've got to do mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. that led to um, in in an eating disorder. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So for me, this took shape um, when I was in my early, well, so about like 10 years ago now, I was working as a marriage and family therapist and doing my own work with the therapist, uh, actually not specifically around those things, but she had let me know that my habits regarding food and exercise were, were a bit obsessive and um, to the point where she was calling it an eating disorder. And quite honestly, I was very surprised by that. Um, you know, I'm sure there was a, a piece of denial in there. Um, however, because a lot of the things that I was engaging in were very much like wellness culture um, adjacent, I'll say. And so trying to eat, quote, perfectly and um, I had kind of gone um, really bought into these cultural narratives around um, food perfectionism and, you know, the more exercise, the better, et cetera, um, which meanwhile, it turns out, um, would led me to this place of um, what my therapist categorized as an eating disorder. So I did take a pause from my work. And through that process, um, I started to see that a lot of the messages that were being believed in the treatment rooms were a lot of the messages that were being believed outside of the treatment rooms as well in terms of, um, you know, what body, what our body should look and look like and what beauty, um, what beauty is essentially. So, but for me in terms of um, how shame showed up, it really was around, um, like, like I alluded to this idea of my food had to be perfect. Um, my exercise was never perfect enough. And so it always was kind of upping the ante. Um, and so that's how it showed up in my own life. Uh, but what was really helpful is to actually have that time and space to uh, dig down on questions like, what is beauty? Because I started to look around again in these rooms and see like, actually what we're being sold as beauty and as quote health and you know what the perfect body looks like this isn't beautiful at all. It's actually like killing some of these women. Um, some of these women will never, you know, perhaps get out of a, treat a treatment setting because of um, how deep into these messages they are. And then, but then, like I said, I saw that that in the, the treatment setting, but I also saw how it was depleting women of life at a very large scale as well, um, you know, started to dig into research showing that like 85 to 95% of women um, are dissatisfied perhaps sometimes to the point of hating their bodies. Um, and so this widespread body shame or shame about how we look, um, I just started to see the the breadth and the depth of, of its impacts. Yeah. So how do we get to that true definition of beauty, mm -hmm. that soul deep beauty? I think it's almost like a, we need a rewiring of our mind. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. No, that's so well said. Um, so in the, in the book, I really do try to use the first half of the book to open our eyes to these lies that were being sold about beauty and where they've come from, because I think it's hard to even start rallying around a new definition of beauty until we can see the, um, 
how broken our cultural definition of beauty is. And so like I like I talk about in the book, this really is the water we've been swimming in. And so I think it's really hard to identify or even see it as being unhelpful until it is until it is pointed out to us and getting the sense of awareness. And then once we can see how it is actually disintegrating uh, us on so many levels, I think then we can start to like let go of it and also see the lies, like see through the lies a lot more easily when it's been pointed out to us. Cause it's, again, it's hard to see the water where we've been swimming in. Uh, but then in my own journey, I did start to see and, and redefine true beauty as the life of God at work in us and among us. Um, and so how we can start living into that, I believe, is first of all, again, when we have that awareness of what uh, broken beauty is, I think we can start to not hold on so tightly and um, let that shame penetrate so deeply when we see that commercial that makes us feel like we need to you know, lose however many pounds or get that cream to fix our wrinkles, which most of those things usually it's like snake oil it's it doesn't really actually help the thing nor does it get to the core of what we actually are looking for um and so um i think we can start to see through those things so we can um shed those ideas around beauty also not spend as much head and heart energy around them and i think that that can look a number of different ways like turning down the volume on cultural beauty i think can look like limiting time on social media being careful of who we follow like looking at you know diverse body shapes and sizes maybe not following fitness influencers oftentimes they are selling products and um selling a certain look of health, health looks a certain way, um, which I don't believe it does. Also, um, when it comes then to authentic beauty, turning up the volume on, um, again, the definition of that I am, you know, um, kind of conveying here or proposing here is the life of God at work in us and among us. And so what does it look like with all five senses to, um, understand and experience this kind of true beauty, like God's life at work in us and around us. And I'll go ahead and just say a little bit more about that definition, if that's okay, to, to give expound on it, because it is kind of abstract. Um, so this came to me from, I have to give credit to uh, Baxter Kruger. He's a theologian who wrote a book called um, The Dance or The Great Dance. I, I always mess that up. But um, his point is that there has been this dance going on between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit throughout all of time. And it's this like, um, energy of love that is being played out among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we see it being played out all around us, like with the laughter of children or in the beauty of nature or like God, God's love at work in me to refine me and to become more truly beautiful. And so I think when we start to let our hearts and our minds dwell there and like with all five senses, trying to embrace that experience of the dance at work in us and around us, I think that that can really uh, help us start to reshape our ideas around beauty, um, especially when we think about, um, I don't know if people are familiar with um, Hebb's axiom, which is a, a tenet of neurobiology, which is what fires together, wires together. And so um, when we think a certain thought or feel a certain feeling or engage in a certain behavior, the more we do, those, do that, think that thought, um, feel that emotion or do that behavior, the more likely it is we're going to do that again because those um, neurons that fire together wire together. And so the more we can move away from these beauty, you know, this this firing of these, um, our, our neurons around cultural beauty. And again, if we go back to that statistic of, you know, 80% of our waking hours being exposed to some kind of media, if we can turn down that volume, turn down that exposure and increase our exposure to true beauty and make having our minds and our hearts dwell on that, I do think that um, that can make some significant shifts um, in terms of how we view ourselves, but also how we define beauty. As I'm listening to you, uh, you know, I, I wonder about some of us who are like, but Melissa, I really do for my health need to do something 
about my weight. And I think what we're talking about is we've got to be so aware of extremes. So in the book, you, you talked about the eating disorder that you were diagnosed with, but you also used the term disordered eating. And so I'd, love, I'd like to have you kind of talk about that a bit. Thank you so much for, for naming that. Cause that is one point, like one part of this, that even the me naming that I did have a diagno diagnosable eating disorder, I, um, at times I shy away from that simply because I don't want people to think that this, oh, if I don't have an eating disorder, then this message is irrelevant to me. Um, there's, I want to reference one survey in particular where like 75% of women reported um, disordered eating behaviors. And so um, if you are wondering like, what's a disordered eating, eating behavior? One would be, an example would be like restricting certain food groups um, or certain foods out of um, fear or just in general. Um, labeling foods as good or bad, moving towards like um, an orthorexia narrative, which is more of like food perfectionism um, and being obsessed with, with quote, healthy foods. So those would be some examples of, um, of disordered eating. And so, yes, your point is, is such a good one. Watching out for disordered eating in our lives. I think that's a good term just to kind of keep at the forefront. You know, as I think about some of my um, friends who have had um, full-fledged eating disorder, been required hospitalization and stuff. Um, well, I know that there was probably it was fed by the cultural message that they were surrounded with. A lot of them can trace it back to early trauma and abuse, and um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that because for them, the eating disorder in an uncontrollable life, that was something they could control or it was something, you know, and then I have another friend who actually went not, didn't limit her food, but over eight to protect herself. And so I think there's lots of facets. How do we bring that pain to the Lord and, and just find some freedom when it comes to those eating disordered eating and maybe protection mechanisms? Absolutely. You make such a good point. Um, because this is multifaceted, you know, and I think it depends on the person in terms of, you know, which factors have played into whatever the relationship, maybe disordered relationship with food is. Um, and how do we bring that to the Lord? I mean, so I I really believe that God desires wholeness for us, you know, in, in all areas. And so, you know, we talked about maybe seeing a um, an anti-diet dietitian or a non-diet dietitian. I also think that the therapy process can be a way that we bring this to the Lord. Being a therapist, I I just see God's hand, you know, whether or not even yes. with a client. Um, I, I work in a place right now that is actually um, most people who come to to see me do have a faith. Um, that being that being said, I really do see God in the healing process, you know, whether it's named for the person or not. And so um I I really am such a believer in therapy being a part of that healing and wholeness process where God comes alongside us in some really profound ways um, to move toward the wholeness that he wants for us. I totally agree. I think I think talking with the therapist, it the most powerful part is getting it out of the dark. You know, I think so much is hidden, so much is internal. And to be able to even get it out there and really find out what we're thinking and what we're feeling and, and, and even the lies that we're believing. As you've worked with some of your clients, what have been some key, maybe aha moments, uh, especially when it comes to soul deep beauty and their relationship with the Lord that has opened some healing for them? Yeah, this is maybe a, a a simple one, but I think some to your point, like I think sometimes having a safe person for to speak and name some of these like these lies that we've been believing about ourselves, ab about our worth, and how oftentimes these distorted ways of thinking we operate from them, uh, or a client may be operating from them, but never perhaps having actually named them. And we can't change something unless we name it and, and recognize it. So I think that that is a really um, helpful piece of this. But also I think that part of the naming is, um, like you mentioned, uh, shame just grows in secrecy. And so 
you know, uh, Dr. Kurt Thompson does a lot of work around this with his confessional communities and just how when we actually name these places of shame in loving community and and see that someone does not walk away in the midst of it, but they keep loving us, how that is actually deeply healing. And, you know, largely because I think that it is representative of this larger relationship we have with God. Um, so we are able to, whether it's a therapist, whether it's maybe, you know, a close friend or maybe it's group therapy or a confessional community uh, where you speak these um, these shame, these places of shame um, in uh, in the presence of a safe person, and they just keep loving you. It's representative of God's unconditional love for us and how we are seen, how we are loved, even in the midst of our brokenness or um, where we feel that we fall short. Yeah, I've had the privilege of, of kind of prayer counseling some people and a lot of those really pivotal memories, those painful memories, those things that maybe were the root of, of some of the behaviors that have been self-destructive. It's just been so powerful to, to watch as we just invite Jesus to that place and, and even put the cross at that place, uh, you know, of just asking that the Lord would cancel the power of some of those lies, some of those false beliefs, even some of those inner vows that, you know, I, I will, I will be safe. I will control whatever that is. Cause I think a lot of times, you know, the fruit is the root. So whatever that thing is that we're struggling with, there's usually something down there deeper and not being afraid of that. I think we get afraid, Melissa. We're, we're, cause we don't know that we want to know. It's, it's one thing to have other people know, but if we bring it out, then we have to get honest about some stuff. What were some of the, the revelations for you in your own journey beyond just the messages that maybe you had internalized as your truth? Were there some key things? Yeah. I mean, there are, you know, a number of key things. Um, one thing that stands out to me I think it was how how strong my the voice of like the self critic had become. Um, I had become so hard on myself in so many ways. Um, yeah, I mean, just across the board. And so for me, learning uh, like about self compassion and this idea of self kindness has been transformational. And you know, actually being gentle with myself and noticing that. That actually is because uh, I think I think we have this like idea in our culture for some reason um, that if we are kind to ourselves, then we're not gonna do anything and we're just gonna like you know underproduce and whatever. Um, but actually, you know, research shows us quite the opposite that people um, are, are uh, actually kind of um, do the things that are are that they're passionate about and um, that they actually become a, a more whole person and a um, more regulated person when they do practice self-compassion. And so um, I have found that to be incredibly helpful. And I mean, when I think about self-compassion, I even think about like integrating, if we integrate spirituality or faith into that, the, the, the person who has researched this a lot is Kristen Neff. And I don't believe she talks about this aspect of it. But one, one thing that I noticed is um, I just, I really notice, um, that when I envision like a self-compassionate voice, it's almost like maybe what God would be saying to me. Um, I don't know if you watch the the Chosen, um, but almost like when when G how they portray Jesus in that series uh, as just such a compassionate presence, um, and how that um, that just sounds like the voice of self-compassion to me, um, and how that actually is motivating to like uh, like in a way that that other that's like a self-critical voice never could be um and so yeah that's been a really helpful piece for me i think that's so powerful so powerful because great uh, guilt is really a horrible motivator i mean it can change us for a while but but it drives us it does it doesn't nourish us and i know for me even in my walk with the lord i was afraid to really receive his grace like, like his love and his grace. I had bought this lie that I was saved 
by grace, but the rest was up to me. And so I better be good, do good. And the thought, like you mentioned, like we're afraid to receive grace because we might, you know, go off the deep end and never care about doing what is good. But the opposite thing happened. It actually became that that holy, beautiful motivation when I operated out of the security of his love rather than the lie that I have to earn his love. And the same thing has been true in giving that same grace to myself. Like giving myself grace because I am my toughest critic. I, I'm with you on that, Melissa. But but that there's no life there. I, I mean, it might some short-term self-improvement but it's agony and it's despair because all it takes is one mess up and all the work you've done is undone. And so I love this. I love this. So this soul deep beauty, I, you know, I think I love this idea that it isn't skin deep, you know, it's not this outer, this outer facade that we project to the world. It really comes from a deep place within. And there are so many you know, as you're even talking, I was just thinking of all the incredibly beautiful women listening, that when I say incredibly beautiful women listening, they go, mm -hmm, not me, not me, because of that self-judgment and that criticalness. How do we, I mean, it's one thing to accept the love of God for us, but how do we begin to accept ourselves Again, with but understanding that that also the Lord wants to transform us, but we don't operate from a deficit; we operate from His love. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, something that's been really, I think, powerful is to know that we have been made in the image of God, and like that—that's what we're working from. I um, mean, God created us good, and so like the beauty is already there. You were, were knit together as, a, you know, like in this sacred miracle that will never happen again. Um, and like your, your life happens once and like your voice is unique and your presence is unique in the world. And, you know, I think we each reflect uh, a certain beauty of a certain component or like a, a piece of God that only we can. Uh, and so, I think that that's just uh, a part of of being human is this endowed beauty that we have, and it, you know. And I think what's what's really makes me mad actually is how Western culture has tried to put a box around this term beauty, and then has tried to sell it. Um, and I just when I think about it that way, I just know and see how false it is. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about, and maybe it's because I have my 40th birthday coming, or maybe it's just I started noticing the, you know, uh, the fragility of life. And so I've been thinking a lot about, uh, I don't know if you'd call it, I mean, just, just life beyond this life. Um, and so really that, that beauty box that our culture gives us, that's going to be nothing on the other side of, of this of this journey on on earth and um i what does matter though or what there is this eternal beauty that is already in us and like i said like i truly believe god is at work in all of us all of the time to continue to cultivate that beauty um more and more and so my my hope and my invitation is that we can um we can all see that beauty that is in us and also continue to see the beauty of God at work all around us. And um, like the the part of this journey that makes me really excited is like, I know that I can't even begin to fathom like the beauty of God. Um, but like what a journey to us, like for, for me to be on, but like to us collectively to be on. I have this line in my podcast, the Impossible Beauty, Podca the Impossible beauty Podcast, where I say, I can't wait for us to see how big true beauty really is. And I just, I feel like um, there is an end, like such anticipation about like, wow, I, I, I'm a little like almost fearful to be like how big it is. Cause I know it'll, it'll feel so big in like a holy and beautiful and amazing way, but I'm like, wow, can, it's going to be so vast. So anyway, but we just get glimpses now. 
I love that. I love that. Well, and I've been thinking of that old story about the, you know, the three blind men and they're all asked to describe what they're touching. And one says, oh, I've got a rope. And the other says, I've got a tree trunk. And the other one says, I've got a hose. They're all feeling an elephant, but they only have a little part. But to flip that analogy a little bit or metaphor and say, that each one of us, as you're talking, each one of us have a facet of his beauty and to fully occupy this God-given space, this God-given life, to, to let him just like unfold us, to become, I like what Charlie Shedd once wrote, he says, oh Lord, help me, help me become, help me discover what you had in mind when you made the original me. Right. And just that becoming and that it's this beautiful partnership with the Lord. It's not something we have to craft or figure out. We just get to be beautiful clay in his hands. And well, this has been a lovely conversation, Melissa. I just wonder, would you pray for us as we close? Mm, yeah, definitely. Uh, God, I just thank you for your presence with us. I thank you for. Um, for who you are. And I thank you that you are love in its purest form. I thank you that your love and your faithfulness uh, are, are always after us uh, and always with us. And I, I just pray that you would just speak to any listeners right now who um, maybe are listening and thinking like, yeah, that sounds great, but, and there's maybe some kind of hesitation. I, I don't know. I just pray against any barriers. I pray that you would speak specifically yeah. to whatever barrier may be coming up for listeners. Um, that maybe it's the voice of shame or a voice of maybe it's something that was told to them when, when they were young, um, or maybe even recently. I I pray that your truth would speak louder yeah. and deeper than any lie or barrier that's holding them back. I pray that. Um, you know, I, I believe that your beauty is true and real and like the the last word. And so I pray that um, that would be and feel real to uh, to listeners right now. Pray that you would give them a vision of how you see them. Um, and I I also pray maybe just for a new awareness. Like as as listeners are exposed to all of these messages we have around you know, uh, earthly or societal beauty that maybe there'd be this new awareness of like the, the lies and this narrow brand of beauty we're being sold, um, in order to elicit shame in order to buy products. And I, I pray for that new, that new filter, um, so that those things can be shed quicker and easier. Um, and also there would be a new awareness of your life at work in them and around them and just Pray for new eyes to see this expansive beauty for for listeners and for us, um, that we could walk into that reality, um, and just greater depth and understanding and experience of how wide and deep um, your your love is. Uh, and so I I just thank you again for for who you are that you are uh, truly beautiful. The world is broken, and and I pray that this beauty that we're talking about, how it can feel maybe like it's too good. Um, I, I pray that uh, we would venture to be to, to hope and to know that it is um, as big and beautiful as um, like beyond what we can imagine. So I thank you for, uh, for being that reality. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.